Hello, everyone. It is Tuesday, June 23rd, and welcome back to Goodfellows, the Hoover Institution broadcast examining the social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns of a world that is ever-changing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm H.R. McMaster, the Hoover Institution's Fawad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow, and I'm sitting in for our usual host, Bill Whalen, who's off this week. Those of you who have been watching us regularly know our format. For you first-time viewers, this is a conversation in which three Hoover Senior Fellows, we call ourselves the Good Fellows, it's irony, by the way, offer their unique insights into what might lie ahead in these complicated times. This week, we're joined by another guest good fellow, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. From January 2005 to 2009, Dr. Rice served as the 66th Secretary of State of the United States. Rice also served as President George W. Bush's Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, or National Security Advisor, from January 2001 to 2005. From 1989 through March 1991, Rice served on President George H.W. Bush's National Security Council staff, serving as director and senior director of Soviet and East European affairs. Since 1981, she held multiple positions at Stanford University, including professor at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, provost, and professor of political science. And as of September 1st, she'll have another title, Director of the Hoover Institution. Some might hope that Dr. Rice might even keep the likes of Cochrane and Ferguson in line, but that is likely to prove an impossible task, and none of us, including Condi, would want Hoover to become a boring think tank. At a time when many in our nation could benefit from a role model and an understanding of how they might serve others, I recommend picking up a book entitled Extraordinary Ordinary People to learn how a native of Birmingham, Alabama overcame the racism of the civil rights era to become a figure skater, concert pianist, and scratch golfer with a PhD in international relations and Russia studies. A scholar, stateswoman, and educator who has made immeasurable contributions in service to her nation and her fellow Americans. Her book and her life is a reminder that even in the most difficult times, we all have an opportunity to help and serve one another. All three of us agree that today we welcome a great fellow. Welcome, Condi. Thank you so much, HR. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's just get one thing straight. I'm a decent golfer, not a scratch golfer. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm not a golfer at all, so I don't even know. <laughs> So now let's meet the regular good fellows. John Cochran is an economist and the Hoover Institution's Rose Marie and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow. He is the author of The Grumpy Economist blog, which you should really bookmark as a must read. Hello, John. Hi, and welcome to Condi. This is gonna be a great pleasure. And last but certainly not least is Neil Ferguson, the Hoover Institution's Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is author of 15 books, most recently, The Square and the Tower. You should also watch his TV series based on that book, Neil Ferguson's Net World, now running on PBS. Hello, Neil. Greetings, HR, and welcome uh, to Condi. I'm more in awe of Condi's musicianship than her golfing skills. <laughs> and uh, we, before we went on air, we were just discussing how it's possible to have piano lessons over Zoom. I can assure you it's even harder for a jazz quintet to rehearse over Zoom. In fact, I think it may be impossible. <laughs> well, again, that's another talent that I, I don't have, Gol neither, neither golfing uh, nor music. But, uh, but Condi, it's great to have you with us. The, the three of us have agreed in previous sessions that the global pandemic has not frozen geostrategic competition. Condi, you're a scholar of Russia, and as our country's senior diplomat, you probably spent more time uh, with Vladimir Putin in small meetings and one-on-one -on -one sessions than any other American. I think our viewers would love to hear your thoughts on the situation in Russia and, and implications of for Russian foreign policy of the COVID pandemic, uh, 
the collapse of, of, of oil prices and, and really what was supposed to be a really big year for Vladimir Putin in connection with extending his rule until 2035 and affecting those changes to the Constitution and a, a massive victory celebration, which is, I think, now scheduled for the 1st of July to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Russia's and, and the, uh, the Allies' victory in, the, in their great patriotic war in World War II. So I just what we, we're anxious to hear what your thoughts are uh, on the trajectory within Russia, the future for Vladimir Putin, and implications, obviously, for the United States and, and, and our allies and partners in Europe in particular. Well, thanks. It's great to be with this uh, collection of uh, good fellows, and uh, I look forward to our conversation. Uh, you're right. COVID-19 has not suspended great power rivalry, but it has uh, shaken up the deck a little bit. And uh, in regards to Russia in particular, as you said, HR, Vladimir Putin thought this was his year. He was going to make constitutional changes that would have extended him into the presidency really uh, as long as he wanted. Um, he was certainly going to get to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Great Patriotic War, which is how the Russians refer to their victory over Nazi Germany. And, and HR, you know, as someone who has been there, that uh, the vestiges of the victory of World War II are still a kind of talisman for the uh, Russian government, earlier the Soviet government, we defeated the great German threat and uh, that was always a source of legitimacy. And so that celebration is extremely important to them. And then finally, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, has always been one who has tried to shift the blame when things weren't going so well in Russia. And if you take those three elements together, you see how COVID has really shaken up politics in Russia. Um, first of all, low oil prices. And so the inability to spread the kind of largesse to his constituents who tend to be older people, less educated people, people who live in rural areas, military, uh, he's really not been able to do it. Uh, in fact, uh, he's had a kind of fight inside of his government that's been more public than, than usual uh, that no, he was not gonna come with a big stimulus package as many other governments did. Uh, because he knows that they're living at the edge, uh, their their uh, reserves are diminishing. So he's got economic problems. Uh, secondly, he planned to have a big election um, and he tried to convince people it was okay uh, to go out. Uh, people weren't buying it. Uh, they first tried to suppress the numbers about uh, how many people were uh, contracting the virus, how many were dying from the virus. That didn't work. Uh, they had to postpone the celebration of the victory over uh, Germany. And uh, perhaps most importantly and interestingly to me, the shifting blame has not worried, has not really worked. What Putin did was he replaced a lot of the governors. Uh, Russia is a huge place, 10 different time zones. Uh, he had uh, governors out in the provinces who were really beholden to him and they were sort of his cronies. Well, funny thing happens when you uh, appoint those people. They turn out to be pretty incompetent. And so uh, he's actually not been able to say, oh, the governors are in charge of this because they've been messing it up so badly out there that actually uh, people are pointing fingers back at, uh, at him in the Kremlin. So it's not been a good year for him. Uh, his uh, poll numbers, to the degree that we can believe them, are down. And when even the Russians admit that his poll numbers are down, uh, he's not a very popular figure. Now, that said, there's really nobody to challenge him. He's going to be president. Uh, but perhaps it's going to clip his wings just a little bit um, in terms of uh, this sense that uh, Russia was ascendant. Connie, I'd like to hear from, from, uh, from Neil and John what they think about the, the implications uh, from a, an economic perspective with the collapse of oil prices, the pressure on Russia. But first, can I just ask you, what impact do you think these problems are going to have on Russia's foreign policy. It seems like he's frustrated externally as well, right? The campaign of subversion against uh, Europe and, and the West, I think we're kind of on to that. Yeah. And then in Syria, his backing of the Assad regime with the offensive into Idlib uh, and, and the, the death of Turkish soldiers during that offensive has resulted in the Turks sending two divisions into northern Idlib and Syria. And the Turks now seem to be engaged in a in a proxy war against Russia's proxies in, in Libya as well. Do you think this might be an opportunity for Putin to take stock and think maybe he ought to rein in this drive to restore Russia to national greatness externally? Or do you think he might double down on that sort of behavior? 
Well, he needed to to do this uh, to reestablish Russia as a great power, and let's let's give him credit. He did pretty well with a very bad hand in places like Syria. By the way, largely because the United States abandoned the field, and when the United States didn't really act, then Russia rush, uh, rushed in. But uh, Assad is not a very reliable um, friend. Uh, they then get involved in Libya, as you say. Uh, this has involved regional powers in ways that they had not, I think, expected. And even as far away as Venezuela, where they are part of the reason that Maduro is still there, you know, the Venezuelans can't pay their bills and Russians are leaving because uh, the Venezuelans can't pay their bills. But look to Putin to keep up this strategy, because from his point of view, he is re-establishing Russian greatness. I'll tell you a really quick little story about being with him once. Uh, he said to me, you know, Kandi, Russia has only been great when it's been ruled by great men like Peter the Great and Alexander II. Now, you know, every bone in your body wants to say, now, do you mean Vladimir the Great, but you're Secretary of State, that would be rude, so you can't say that. But in fact, that's who he thinks he is. And he's He's overcoming the humiliations of the Cold War. He's at the end of the Cold War. He's reestablishing Russia. I don't see him backing off that, uh, but we may see less further expansion because, frankly, he's been checkmated at a couple places. I think the move of heavy, uh, heavy brigades into Poland and into the Baltic states, of which you were a part, HR, when you were in the White House, um, you know, we've sent some pretty strong signals about uh, NATO. So uh, I don't expect him to stop the strategy. He's not going to become a friend of the United States, but uh, it's pretty costly. And I'm not sure he can expand much further than he is now. Great. Well, th thanks, Condi. Well, I guess there are real constraints on him, though, economically. And, and I wonder if, John, if you might just really uh, help our viewers understand better, what are the economic dy dynamics that are uh, that they're going to affect Russia, maybe even Russia's relationship with China. Uh, wh what are your observations on? Well, it's it's on not a hard economic question. So, you know, you can use rhetoric about greatness, but if you're exporting oil and importing anything else that counts, you're not an economic contender. Uh, now, you may be able to afford to keep Soviet era nuclear stuff going, and, and uh, you can afford to cause a lot of trouble on a regional scale, uh, but you're just not a contender for world power status. Now, that trouble is, is definitely a problem. And, you know, but this is just the idea that we're back to any sort of uh, great power competition on a global stage with Russia, that, that's just not happening. Now, there's a lot of, I'd like to ask Condi, there's, there's a lot of trouble on the horizon. Um, and, and in particular, um, so the oil prices, low oil prices, who Putin, it's, it's kind of too bad that the U.S. now is in the business. We are now an oil exporter, too. <laughs> and our administration seems to think that high oil prices uh, might be a good thing because uh, we're in the same boat. It's kind of too bad we're not hitting them where it hurts. Um, but the U.S. has a certain lack of steadfastness as an as a economist who thinks sort of in game theory terms. Um, selling out the Kurds not only let Russia in, but it said horrible things to anyone who believed America's promises. We gave a written guarantee to Ukraine, give up your nukes and we guarantee your territorial integrity. Uh, we seem to be, Russia seems to be just playing the long game and waiting for us to give up on this one. Uh, and around the world, believing that America is steadfast in what she says uh, seems to be vanished. Now that's our own internal politics. Each administration seems to just say, well, we're tearing up the rule book from the last one. Uh, but in any way, it's, I'd be curious on your comments, at least on how do we get some reputation for meaning our promises, and your comments, as long as we're talking about economics, on, the, uh, on sanctions. Our one tool seems to be economic sanctions. We're especially mean to the people in power. You can't, you know, we, we're trying to control their overseas bank accounts and stuff like that. But, you know, we've been trying that against Cuba for a long time. Uh, and um, I just wonder where you think... Uh, is that working? If not, what else should we be doing? Uh, how long is it before we just let them swallow um, uh, part of Ukraine? Uh, although, creditably, we did stop them from taking the next step in that. And sometimes, John, that's all you can do. Uh, in terms of Ukraine, uh, the annexation of Crimea, we weren't going to be able to do anything militarily, certainly, but what we could say is no further. This is essentially what we did with Georgia uh, when they uh, essentially hived off uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, uh, I know personally that they had plans for Tbilisi. Uh, 
And so we said no further. And so sometimes that's all you can do. Uh, I do think we've got a, a problem, if you will, a credibility problem. By the way, it goes back a couple of administrations because there was a sense uh, that America was tired. America was ready to withdraw. America was ready to let somebody else do the job. And of course, what happens is nobody else steps up except bad guys like the Iranians or to a certain extent, the Russians who, as you say, they're disruptive power. They can't do anything positive. So they disrupt because they don't have the assets, the economic assets, the political assets to do positive things, but they do have the capacity to disrupt. And that's uh, basically what they've done. Uh, as to sanctions, um, you make a very good point about sanctions. Look, sanctions are sometimes your only tool, um, and they are particularly a favorite of the Congress, which sometimes puts them in place in ways that they are actually um, a kind of uh, a kind of ball and chain around an administration that's trying to carry out a, a foreign policy. And I think in the case of Russia, uh, we may actually be at the point where we're starting to undo what we should be looking for in Russia. Vladimir Putin's not going to be there forever. And 25 years, uh, now almost 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russians are different. There are Russians who have studied in the United States, who got, who worked in law firms. I've trained some of them myself. And they're barely hanging on, trying to, uh, to build a different kind of Russia. They're working in the knowledge-based economy. They don't want to be a 19th century extractive industries economy. And those are the people that leave aside the sanctions on Putin and his cronies. I don't mind that. But I have a former student, for instance, uh, who uh, can't get visas for his people to come to the United States because the sanctions are so broad. So we have to be really careful that we don't use this as a blunt instrument that ends up cutting off our nose to spite our face and isolating the very people uh, who we would like to uh, to have more power. And if oil prices continue to go to be low, maybe some other kind of Russia starts to emerge. You know, I wonder if you might pick up on Condi's point and, and really speculate the, the degree to which you think the current circumstance might lead Russia to, to come back to the West. It seems like in this, in this comprehensive strategic partnership with China that Vladimir Putin chose uh, an eastward movement uh, and this relationship with China. Do you think there is an, an opportunity if we do take actions like relax some of these sanctions, maximize positive interactions with those who lie outside of Putin's inner circle, that there might be a prospect for, for pulling Russia back westward? Well, you know, HR, back uh, four years ago, uh, when uh, we were uh, reeling from Brexit and beginning to consider the possibility of uh, Donald Trump as, as president, I, I started thinking maybe uh, one potential opportunity of a Trump presidency uh, would be to uh, start a new chapter with, with Russia and take advantage of the obvious uh, sympathy that uh, Donald Trump felt towards Vladimir Putin. It hasn't happened. And uh, in, if anything, the relationship such as it is has brought nothing but trouble to President Trump uh, in at least two different respects. Uh, the, the Mueller report, uh, and then we had the Ukraine scandal. Uh, meanwhile, I don't see any sign of Russia changing course. Uh, President Putin, if, if anything, has, has uh, cleaved closer to China in the last four years. Uh, that relationship is one of the closest in world politics today. But make no mistake, Russia is the junior partner. It's the opposite of the relationship that existed uh, back in the early years of the People's Republic when Mao very clearly played second fiddle to Stalin in the early years before he broke with him. It's worth echoing John's point. Uh, Russia is not in the big league anymore. Uh, in per capita GDP terms, uh, it is actually down there with Costa Rica. Uh, and on aggregate GDP terms, it's actually behind Canada. So it's definitely not uh, one of the top players economically. But in Putin, it has one of the world's most skilled strategists. And I think what's fascinating is to watch him try to find a way, not around the, the sanctions, uh, which there's nothing much he can do about, but around Russia's uh, apparently limited room for maneuver with respect to the West. I've just spent the last uh, few hours reading Putin's 
fascinating historical essays. They're essays, although he delivered them as speeches, which uh, I, I urge you to take a look at because it's quite fascinating to watch this obviously highly intelligent man trying to rewrite the history of World War II, particularly its origins, uh, and at the same time uh, make the case for revitalizing the permanent members of the UN Security Council as a kind of condominium of great powers. That's a very interesting move by Putin, uh, where he's arguing, leave aside uh, G20s, uh, G7s, let's get together in the, old, in the old ways, the permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, this is a pitch which uh, President Trump is uh, clearly sympathetic to. It's a pitch to Macron, the French president. It's pitch to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, let's reform the P5 band. Uh, and from Russia's point of view, that would be a, a really quite significant uh, breakthrough if you could get that to happen. The summit he would like to see would, of course, be an enormous setback for the European Union, which has its pretensions to being uh, a superpower somewhere between the US and China. So I think that is the way Putin is thinking about this. He knows he's not a big economic player, but he is a big military player, as you know, and as you mentioned, he's able to do all kinds of things, Syria, now Libya. But I think the big game for Putin is to try to bring back the permanent members of the UN Security Council as a kind of force uh, in geopolitics. And I think it'll be interesting to see if he gets anywhere with that. It's always interesting to see how, how people uh, manipulate history to try to, to make an argument for, for, for a, a current uh, policy or, or a proposal. Uh, you know, in this case, really just overlooking the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. <laughs> but it's, it's not overlooking it, HR. What, what Putin has done in uh, two successive speeches is actually to do a kind of revisionist account of the events of 1938-39. He's got some serious researchers digging away in the archives. And, and the argument that he makes is one that will be familiar to all scholars of appeasement, that in the end, Russia was the, what was the power of the Soviet Union, I should say, left high and dry by the conniving appeasers in London and Paris, uh, that, uh, that essentially left Russia with no alternative uh, but to cut a deal with Hitler in 1939. But it's fascinating to me that Putin takes the time to get into the footnotes of the historiography of the 1930s uh, to try to rehabilitate the Soviet Union. Now, there are two things going on here which are fascinating, one of which is this reassertion of continuity. Russia today is the heir of the Soviet Union, and it is the heir of the great triumph of the Great Patriotic War, hence this desire for the parade, which I think is actually happening tomorrow, the Victory Parade. But the other thing that's going on is to push back against the European Union. The reason that Putin made these speeches was precisely because the EU uh, made last year a somewhat uh, unflattering allusion to precisely the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939. And the idea that the Russians, the Soviets, started World War II simultaneously uh, in lockstep with Hitler is one that Putin is very determined to push back against, hence this foray into, into historiography. You know, I, I was just going to pick up on something, uh, Neil, that you said, and it is that many of these leaders, uh, authoritarians, uh, need legitimacy. And they very often find it in historical uh, rewriting history or in even philosophical debate. Uh, our sources of legitimacy for democratic leaders, they're elected. That's their source of, of legitimacy. But it, it's actually reminiscent of Gorbachev, who spent an inordinate amount of time reading Lenin and trying to find a kind of philosophical and ideological legitimacy for what he was doing in the Soviet Union through Perestroika and uh, Glasnost. And he went deep into Lenin to do it. And we know he read this himself. Now Putin does it, of course, with history. Uh, we know that uh, the Chinese leaders, Xi Jinping and others, do the same thing. And so I think in some ways what you see with these authoritarians is they need some source of continuity, some source of legitimacy. It's not there in the institutions. And so they look to ideology and history to do it. The other source of legitimacy, of course, is, is doing a good job. Uh, nothing like prosperity. Uh, and, and, and the Chinese got this for a while. Uh, the legitimacy really was, hey, look at this astounding era of economic growth where we rescued you from poverty. And that's really, in some sense, the tragedy of Russia. Um, Russia was on the technological frontier, the USSR. 
was decently in league. I mean, it wasn't on the frontier, but they did make rockets that went to the moon. They did make nuclear weapons. They did make nuclear power plants, maybe not very good ones. And the tragedy of their economics since the 1990s uh, is, is one that we should reflect on. I mean, we tend, tend to think of authoritarian versus democratic, but there's all sorts of different kinds of authoritarian. It's, it's maybe one of the famous multiple ways of having unhappy families. And I think there's a lesson here that a, a kleptocracy is even worse than a, commun than a functional communist party. Uh, Russia was way ahead in the 1990s of China. They have a highly, they had and, and still have a highly educated population. They come here and, and they do all sorts of wonderful things. There's, there's no greater defender of freedom than a Russian immigrant, at least judging from my Uber drivers, uh, as far as I can tell. They, it really is a tragedy that they are reduced to um, a steadily declining resource base. They're sort of like the Venezuelans who can't even operate the, the pumps anymore. Um, so it's, it's a particularly unfortunate kind of authoritarianism. Not, not even good at being authoritarians, but the Chinese are with their social credit systems and, and face cameras all over the place. Yeah, I, I agree, John. I will say this, though, about authoritarians who depend on... on uh, prosperity for legitimacy. And I agree completely with what the Chinese have done, is it, it's never a long-term strategy. Because one of the problems is people's expectations start rising. And now your uh, ability to deliver what the next generation considers prosperity uh, looks different than perhaps what you're capable of doing. And the Chinese know that they're in something of a race. You know, one of the interesting things that happened uh, with, with COVID-19 is, of course, for the first time they put out uh, unemployment targets, but not growth targets, which suggests that they know that they've got a gap between expectation and what they're going to actually be able to deliver. Uh, and just one other point before we move on from Russia, you're, you're absolutely right that they seem to be at the technological frontier in the 90s, but it was really on the military side alone. They could not uh, deliver a refrigerator that worked. Um, I remember going to the Soviet Union for the first time as a student in 1979, and I noticed that this great military power that I had studied, that when I went to buy something in the store, they were ringing it up on an abacus. And so uh, there was this great split between their military prowess and their civilian base. And it's eventually what destroyed them. Um, you know, they, they, they would have those same resources, those same educated people, technically knowledgeable you had lots of STEM. They they could have transferred. Their hackers are wonderful. They 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 tried, they tried John, but the but the the structure wouldn't allow them to do it. Um, I remember when Medvedev was here in in uh, 2011, and uh, he he said, you know, we have the best mathematicians. True, we have great software engineers. We could lead the knowledge based revolution. You want to say, yeah, the problem though is that they're all working in Tel Aviv and Palo Alto. They're not working in Moscow. And so this was a systemic failure, I think. Yeah, perhaps what you're saying is that the, the kleptocracy that underlies a perpetual military state is just one that's going to turn into a civilian kleptocracy and yeah. not one that can open up to the kind of economic freedom that you need to use those assets in, in a productive way. Exactly. That's a good insight. And an authoritarian regime is going to do everything possible to, to remain in, in power, to extend and tighten its exclusive grip on power. Of course, this is uh, the dynamic that we see in China with the Chinese Communist Party under the leadership of Xi Jinping. And I think it's clear to the world now that that rather than the, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, as it prospered, liberalizing its economy and and uh, and liberalizing its form of governance, that quite the opposite is, is happening. And and Condi, I'd love to hear what you think about what's happening now uh, in, in connection with a series of aggressive actions that, that China has taken to, to tighten its exclusive grip on power internally, to extend that authoritarian control to Hong Kong. There have been a number of incidents in the South China Sea recently, now clashes uh, with the Indian Army on the Himalayan frontier uh, along the Indian border. And, and then, of course, the continuing threatening posture uh, toward toward Taiwan, and it seems as if if the party is acting aggressively, maybe because it's confident. But it occurs to me that that it might be it, be driven mainly by an element of fear or trepidation. In that this fleeting window of opportunity for the party to consolidate its power, to realize its dreams of of national rejuvenation, 
that window might be closing more rapidly in the post-COVID world, especially with the global recession, the impact, as you already mentioned, on, on China's economic growth, and maybe at the beginning of a sense that this really aggressive posture associated with the wolf warrior diplomacy oriented at the United States and, and Europe might be generating a backlash as well. What do you think is motivating the Chinese Communist Party? Is this a dangerous time? And, and how might we respond to what seems to be really aggressive action uh, across, uh, across, uh, across the front? I, I really do think it's a dangerous time. And it's a dangerous time uh, because miscalculation is always possible when you have military force of this kind, uh, you know, the kind of miscalculation that might have caused uh, even a greater crisis uh, on the border with India, for instance. Uh, the first crisis we actually had in the Bush administration was when the Chinese forced an American aircraft down on Henan Island. Uh, they kept our crew for over a week. It was, in fact, a Chinese pilot hot dogging in international airspace. He hit our plane. So you can have miscalculations and accidents. Uh, I, the, the, the motivation for this uh, is, frankly, I'm a little surprised by what we're seeing, uh, because for so many years, as you know, the Chinese uh, were, were burying their international ambitions, and uh, they, they talked about being just a developing country. They really didn't want a world role. And I can, I can attest, they were actually hard to get them to do anything. When we put them in the chair for the six-party talks with North Korea, I would get so frustrated, I would say, you're not the party planner, all right? You've actually got to go and talk to the North Koreans, because it was always somebody else's obligation to do something. Well, this is a reversal now. We're seeing them want to assert themselves. And it's not just asserting themselves in the South China Sea or on the border with India. Uh, it's also asserting themselves in uh, Belt and Road uh, to try and garner uh, influence uh, in uh, far-flung corners of the world. It was uh, what I've told my Chinese friends was one of the dumbest speeches any Chinese leader has ever given, which was the Xi Jinping speech, which challenged the United States on frontier technologies like AI and uh, quantum computing, because when you challenge the United States, we get our backs up. And uh, now we're going to deny you access to these technologies. And we're really becoming now two very separate technology universes. Uh, it was always gonna happen on the internet. You know, there was this notion of the internet is democratizing. Well, it turns out the Chinese had a different view of the internet. It was a means of social control. And that is simply irreconcilable with the West's view of the internet. And by West, I mean places like Japan and India as well. But pretty much you go on, you see what you want, you talk to whom you want, uh, you, you read what you want. Totally opposite view. So that was always going to be a separate universe. But if you look at what's happening with supply chains, if you look at what's happening with uh, the separation, the United States talking about bringing uh, research and development for pharma, uh, for pharmaceuticals back home because of what happened with COVID-19. If you look at what's happening with uh, something I think could be quite dangerous, trying to shut universities off to Chinese students and postdocs, um, we're becoming two very separate technological spheres. And uh, I don't know where that leads ultimately. As some have called this a decoupling war. I think Neil you know, initially called it, you know, the, the trade war was not really a trade war, it was a tech war. And, and it's moving toward, I think, the analogy of the, of the, of the Cold War. Uh, but, but it's really a decoupling competition, I think. And I think it's going to be really important that we adopt the right policies. For example, I, I saw the recent restrictions on H-1B visas. I think what actually might be beneficial uh, in connection with advantaging the, Uni the United States, disadvantaging the Chinese Communist Party, would be to offer H-1B visas for Chinese nationals that are working for U.S. companies that that are subjected to the coercive power of the Chinese Communist Party to get them out from under that that coercive power um, and uh, and and allow them to, uh, to to be creative and to and to help the U.S. companies succeed. But Neil, I wondered what you think about this. And John, of course, I know that you you've looked very hard at the economic dimension of this and and have made the argument that we we should try to uh, pursue an economic policy that that preserves the advantages associated with free trade, but it seems like really based on the policies of Xi Jinping, that's becoming more and more difficult to do. And we are in a decoupling competition. Neil, where, where do you see U.S. policy headed and, and, and what would you recommend? Well, HR and, uh, and, and Condi on this question of visas, 
Uh, some recent research that just came out last week shows that in the artificial intelligence competition, uh, the competition for talent, uh, the U.S. wins uh, by having uh, a relatively open uh, a policy, and the, the flows are really striking. Uh, the, the research shows that of the top AI researchers in the world, really substantial proportions start their careers in China, uh, but they quickly move to the United States. And if we are smart, they, they stay in the United States. Sure, we need to be cautious because at least some uh, Chinese uh, uh, tech uh, experts have turned out to be spies, but it's a t pretty small number, I would have thought. And if you just think about this, this competition for talent, uh, one of the things that the United States got very right in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War was that we got an awful lot of former Soviet talent to come uh, to the US. So I think we're probably all of one mind on this this question. But I want to raise something which is more in, in your domain, HR. I've just been reading Michelle Flournoy's uh, new essay in uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, which seems to uh, uh, share a great many uh, uh, points of view with, uh, with you and indeed with, with Chris Brose, John McCain's uh, former uh, aide, whose, whose book on, uh, on the, the military situation we've talked about in in previous issues. Uh, when, I, when I read Michelle Flournoy's case, it seems to me that we do have a problem, that we don't have credible deterrence with respect to China anymore. A couple of things have happened which I'm really interested in. One, I think the Chinese are starting to underestimate us and to regard the United States as being in such a mess with COVID-19, with the economy, with our polarized politics, that they're actually underestimating us altogether. And the second thing that's going on is I think real, and that is that we do have a lot of legacy capabilities with respect to our military that aren't actually capable of deterring the Chinese if they decide to take risk in say Taiwan or the South China Sea. Uh, now, I, I don't know how far you share these concerns specifically on our military capability. I'd also love to hear Conde's thoughts on this. But as an historian, I know that wars happen when a rising power doesn't feel sufficiently deterred by the incumbent power, and particularly when that rising power, for domestic reasons, is ready to take some risk. I've always thought of Xi Jinping as a slightly Wilhelm II figure, somebody who wants to strut on the world stage and pursue a kind of Chinese Weltpolitik. I worry a lot that in this very turbulent year that we're having, that these rising uh, power types in China, the wolf warrior diplomats, might just be tempted to do something rash in Taiwan, precisely because we can't really deter them enough. Well, I mean, two aspects on this I'd like to comment on is, first of all, we have to, 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 to believe that that uh, the People's Liberation Army, at least the possibility that the People's Liberation Army is believing the Chinese Communist Party propaganda. And, and Connie, uh, Connie mentioned the Hainan Island incident with this hot-dogging pilot. I think that pilot was indicative of the PLA believing that it was really time to, to flex China's muscles in the, in the South China Sea. I think this might be an element of what we've seen on the, the Chinese Indian border as well. And then you compound that, I think, by the fact that hey, if you're if you're in, in, in uh, Xi Jinping's inner circle, you're probably not going to bring him bad news. You know, I think you're probably going to say things like, "Great idea, Chairman. I wish I'd thought of that." Or, "Look how screwed up the Americans are." To to uh, to your point, Neil, and I think this might be a period in which Xi Jinping feels like he's winning. You know, hey, you've got hypersonic weapons. You know, you have a much more capable PLA. Look at look at the United States. We can divide it at this time. So I think it does make it a dangerous period of time. I think that they would miscalculate, the Chinese would, because if they see the vulnerabilities based on some of the capabilities, military capabilities they developed, because our joint force still has a tremendous ability to combine different types of, of weapon systems in the context of a campaign. I mean, the, the, the Chinese military has not fought really since, uh, you know, since the 1970s. Uh, and and I, I think that they would they would it would be a huge mistake uh, to think that they could that they could win you know a, a quick you know battle of intimidation in the South China Sea East China Sea vis a vis Taiwan. But what we do need to do is to understand better what are these countermeasures that the People's Liberation Army have developed to what they saw as our advanced technological military capabilities and develop countermeasures to those countermeasures uh, with systems that degrade gracefully 
some some additional capacity. And I think you've seen already some actions taken, for example, uh, with with the withdrawal from the INF Treaty based on the fact that Russia wasn't adhering to it. That really gives us, I think, the ability to pose the Chinese with some real, uh, real significant military dilemmas uh, in, in the in the inner and outer island chains, the first and second island chains. But, but Connie right. and John, any any comments on 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 um, on these aspects of the problem? I'd, I'd like to jump in just on a couple of the issues that you brought up recently. Um, for before we before we fight, get ready to fight World War III. Um, so Condi, Bruce Condi said something very deep that I, I want to go back to um, about the transition. Uh, of, that that uh, she said that um, you gain legitimacy from economic growth only temporarily, and then people demand more, which is exactly what we said. Now, now then, UHR said that the Chinese government didn't liberalize, but the process isn't the government offers liberalizing. The tr- pro- process is the people demand it, and the government is forced to do it. I think that sets up the picture of the Chinese government is in great fear. They got to the point where people were going to start demanding uh, a better government, and they knew that better government was not going to involve the Chinese Communist Party running things the way they do. And so I think it's important. I see a lot of fear, even in their external adventurousness. You know, historical analogies, um, uh, the U.S. cutting oil off to Japan as part of a san- sanctions in the 1930s, uh, I think, was a a failure to understand the other side's point of view. Now, we don't have to agree with the point of view, but unless you're willing to fight World War III to the end and remove the Chinese Communist Party, their number one thing is how do we stay in power? So I think understanding that and their fear, I, I, I think is, is uh, helpful on this. Um, we mentioned, I just wanna go back to the openness. There is a detail in the, uh, in, we are all very sad to see H-1B visas stopped on the outrageous pretext that people are bringing in COVID-19. Uh, but some of our uh, some of our friends of Hoover were working in the background and they actually, if you read the details, there's also a reform of H-1B gonna go on, which is that it's not gonna be based just on the lottery anymore. Uh, it's gonna have a more rational basis going forward. So I think there is hope there because the interchange of ideas is so important. Now, Condi said this and I, and I wanna emphasize it, you know, letting Russians come here and see how this place works is really important. Letting Chinese people come here and see how this place works is really important. Uh, when they, uh, we've all met Chinese colleagues, some of the best economists now are coming from mainland China, and they come in their eyes. They have been fed a diet of propaganda. Their eyes are wide open. This is a way that our message can percolate back. Now, there is a, you know, a, a American college degree is a big uh, status symbol in China. It's a little curious why they come here. Maybe it's because our colleges teach communism better than the Chinese colleges do. Uh, <laughs> but they pick up something uh, of the rest of the culture while, while they're here. So keeping that openness is, I think, incredibly important. And last, so Conde, you haven't been with us. We have a weekly fight about uh, the uh, uh, economics as a strategic uh, thing where I fight against a competitive mercantilism as a goal of policy. And I point out routinely how trying to one-up the Chinese in their industrial policy is a disaster as every industrial policy that we've tried to run in the past has been a disaster. John, uh, I'm on your side on this one, so uh, I'm going to start there in just a second. But let me let me just say one thing on the military side. Um, the Chinese would also make a very big miscalculation on Taiwan because we have really helped make Taiwan a lot more capable on its own. Um, I think for the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, some of the arms transfers to Taiwan have actually been quite significant. And uh, while undoubtedly China could eventually, ultimately defeat a Taiwan, it would be bloody ugly and uh, and not so much fun. And so I hope the the one problem that I think is sometimes when you have a Xi Jinping who's made himself the closest thing to Mao, uh, whoever it was that said people don't tell him the truth, I hope people are telling him the truth. That's always the danger with a an isolated authoritarian that they're not getting the clear picture about what this could could really look like. Uh, but I, I want to take up John's uh, challenge here on industrial policy. Um, we don't do it well, right? We mess it up. Um, and I really, uh, I'm not even particularly uh, one who believes in national strategies for X. Now, why is that? I, I think the way that we've innovated, the way that we've gained is actually because we've had multiple sources of innovation 
And those multiple sources of innovation have been, in a sense, competitive with one another. And ultimately, uh, it's a sort of Darwinian process by which the best gets, uh, gets pushed forward. Now, uh, everybody says, but didn't we have a national strategy after World War II uh, through Vannevar Bush and the way that we used, but what we, it, was, it was quite the opposite of a national strategy. It was um, federal support for basic fundamental research in first some labs like Bell Labs and others, but most importantly in universities. And it was peer reviewed research and that then led to multiple answers to every question. And so um, my own view is let's do this our way. Um, one of the things that has bothered me about the China discussion by some of our leaders is we sound so fearful and we sound so they're doing this to us. I said to one of our great national leaders, I loved your speech on China, uh, but where was Ronald Reagan in that speech? And this person said, what did you mean? I said, you know, free peoples will always triumph uh, was Reagan's line. And so you can have uh, a national effort, but a national strategy kind of scares me. And an industrial policy scares me even more. Just one final little vignette about this. So Bill Perry, our colleague um, at Stanford, who was uh, at the time the undersecretary for research and engineering, was apparently testifying in Congress. Um, and this was would have been um, in the uh, late 1970s when he was working for uh, the Clinton administration. I'm sorry, for the Carter administration. And uh, he was asked, uh, so what about this? thought about personal computers. And he said he saw no purpose in personal computers. Bill Perry is one of the smartest men I know. And that's what happens when governments start picking winners and losers. And I'm sorry, industrial policy always leads to picking winners and losers. I'll stay distributed in our innovation. And um, I would increase the National Science Foundation budget by a lot. Um, my minister says that uh, a lot of our federal spending is going into the National Institutes of Health, and that's because we're determined to do something about that 100% death rate. And so if we uh, can just think about the fact that maybe we don't just want to try, try to prevent uh, the inevitable, maybe a little bit of money that uh, could go toward National Science Foundation and uh, efforts like that. Condi, while, while we still have time, I think it's worth bringing up one other issue that we haven't touched on. And, and that's something that really does remind me of, of the Cold War, the way the Chinese are commenting on and making much of our current internal divisions. The Soviets used to love to do that in their propaganda. In fact, they consistently would uh, represent the United States as riven by racial division during the entire civil rights period. Uh, we can't really uh, leave this out of the conversation from the Chinese vantage point, this country is an enormous revolutionary state and their, their news media uh, are, are making the most of it. So maybe we should talk a little bit about the perception that American democracy is failing, particularly on the question of racial inequality. Your book, which, uh, which touched on these issues so brilliantly by relating the civil rights movement to later democratization movements, seems like a great place to start a conversation about uh, where we are now. Well, I am concerned. I think the world uh, is looking and, you know, both friend and foe are a little uh, worried about us, so to speak. And uh, friends, I think, worry about us because they know that a world in which the United States is distracted in some way, um, you know, it's not that people always do what the United States wants done, but the United States was always there as a kind of governor to make sure that nothing really crazy happened. And I think people are worried because we're distracted. And I do think foes think we're distracted as well. And you have to be concerned that they might uh, overestimate our distraction. So yes, this is not a good time. And how do we deal with it? Well, one really big difference uh, right now, uh, one of the things I said in, in uh, Democracy about America was the extraordinary circumstance in which the descendants of slaves actually used the American Constitution and its institutions to improve the rights of, uh, sorry, the, the, to, to, to improve the rights of the descendants of those slaves. So if you think back to the great civil rights movement, it had protests. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. I saw those protests. 
uh, it had some uh, violence, mostly done to the protesters by police commissioner Bull Connor and his people. But it also had a strategy for legislation and for institutional reform. And that strategy really begins all the way back in the 1930s with Thurgood Marshall and others in the NAACP choosing cases to take before the Supreme Court to try to move the legal frontiers forward. They won some, they lost some. We all know Brown versus the Board of Education, but there were many of these cases. And so they really made use of the institutional framework that had been founded by slave owning Thomas Jefferson and our founding fathers. That's an extraordinary story. What's different this time is that people are being told those institutions are not for you. Those institutions have pulled the wool over your eyes. This is the kind of, pos the kind of uh, populist disintermediation of institutions, right? We we've seen it throughout history. What do populists do? They tell you, don't trust those elites. Don't trust those institutions. Go directly through me. And of course, social media has made this the uh, populist dream because you literally can go directly uh, to the people. And so somehow we've got to reestablish that the way to change is through the institutions that we were left that give us a vehicle for, for peaceful change. It's why I think so much is riding on the police reform debate. Uh, if we can actually show that through legislation, both at the national and at the state level, because we're federalist, uh, a, a, a federalism is important. If we can show that through changes in legislation, changes in the way policing is done, et cetera, et cetera, we will reestablish that institutions are the way to do this. And there is nothing worse than when you have total disintermediation of institutions and you just have a populist leader and a mob. That's a disaster for everybody. So um, I'm, I'm concerned, I'm worried. Let me just say one word about, about race relations. Um, look, this is, this is a visceral issue in the United States. Uh, it's different than ethnicity, race, because essentially Africans and Europeans came to the United States, to what would become the United States, in the, in the late 16th and early 17th century at the same time, Africans in chains. And one of the reasons that I tend to use black and white is because African-American actually mimics an immigrant narrative that isn't true. Instead, what you had was two founding populations, if you will, indigenous people, losing big in the process. And those founding populations intermixed in very fundamental ways. My DNA is 40% European. My great grandmother's father was the slave owner. So my great great grandfather was the slave owner. This makes race visceral and hard in a way that is hard for us to get our arms around. And so I think the conversations that we're starting to have now, and I hope, by the way, there will be conversations, not just people yelling at each other about it, are going to be essential to untangling this. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that despite of all of the evils of slavery, despite of all of the evils of uh, the failure of Reconstruction, despite of all of the failures of Jim Crow and beyond, there was progress by those descendants of slaves to the point that we can now talk about uh, two Black secretaries of state, two Black attorney generals, a Black president of the United States, uh, scores of successful Blacks, and the institutions helped to make that happen. And so while we're going through this next phase, and I do think we're now in a different phase, I hope we don't lose sight of how important those institutions can be. Well, Colin, kind of like we are, go ahead, John. I'm just gonna say that there is a array of optimism here that this is like the civil rights era, one with loonies on both sides uh, saying, saying awful things, uh, but, <laughs> 
you can see already the beginnings of institutional reform that we will take seriously, not just policing of, of Black and African American communities, but policing in general, which has grown um, it too, too violent, too oppressive in the United States. Um, and I think we, we will take, ser I hope we will take seriously schools in minority communities, the economic devastation of the inner cities. I, both parties have a lot to blame here, but it does, there is some hope that this is one of those, that we come out of this and, and, and are seen internationally to come out of this, one of those moments when America reached out and takes some big steps as we did in the civil rights year. It sounds like you are similarly hopeful. I am hopeful. And, and um, I, I just want to say something about Hoover in this regard, because uh, we've, we've seen through COVID-19 and what we're seeing, um, we have a lot of problems of inequality and they're pretty deep. Um, if you think about people who were able to work from home like us, we didn't lose any productivity. You know, we have great tools. But if you had to go to the shop floor or to the restaurant, you're unemployed. That's, an, that's a structural inequality. Think about the kid whose parents are well-educated and they're studying at home. I was actually homeschooled my first, in first grade because my mother was a teacher. I was going to have to skip a year because I was born in November. You had to be born in October to go to first grade. My mother stayed home for a year. I was By the time she was done with me, I was ready to go into third grade. But think about the kid whose parents don't speak English. We have some very big structural inequalities. We also have, as you said, John, you know, the need to, to do these reforms. And so I think that Hoover, from a perspective of uh, people who believe in free markets, free peoples, believe in these institutions, believe in a sensible American role in the world, that our deep scholarship which really tries to bring data analysis, real research to some of these big problems can help to move us forward to different solutions. That's why I wanted to be director of the Hoover Institution with all of you uh, uh, ungovernable, uh, unruly uh, fellows, because I think we can make a difference in this particular point in time. And uh, somebody had better make a difference because uh, I said in recently in, a, in an interview, I really appreciate very much the concerns of our friends and allies who are going into the streets to march in solidarity with what's happened here. But look in the mirror, guys. Um, when you talk about race and ethnicity and, uh, and problems, America's had a sh her share. But we've also shown a willingness to want to change. I'm not so sure that's true of most countries in the world. Well, Condi, I can't think of a better way to end this episode of Goodfellows than, than, uh, than to hear from you on what's going on in our country today. And, and I hope that everyone, I hope all of our viewers read chapter one of, of your book, Democracy. I think it's, it's needed. And I'm thinking of the, the last line uh, in your book, Democracy, in, in which you said democracy really is, is, is said about democracy, that no matter how imperfect democracy is, it remains the only system that fully accords with the non-negotiable demands of human dignity. Thank you for the wonderful message you've given all of us. And thank you for your willingness to lead the Hoover Institution into the, into the next century. And, and for our viewers, I would just like to say that, that uh, what Herbert Hoover conveyed to the board over 70 years ago was very consistent with, with what you just heard from uh, from Dr. Rice. And he charged the board with uh, ensuring that Hoover constantly and dynamically points the road to peace, to personal freedom, and to the safeguards of the American system. So for all of our, to all of our viewers on behalf of the, of the Hoover Goodfellows, myself, uh, jo John Cochran, Neil Ferguson, and, and our great fellow, uh, Condi Rice, um, Th thank you for joining us today. We wish you the very best. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll do our best here at the Hoover Institution to help you stay informed.